Good morning, everyone. We're at the top of the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. As I'm sure Marla has a lot of information to go through um, again today. So welcome to the BKD Billing and Coding Boot Camp. This is day two of the Rural Health Clinic session and day three overall. If you remember, many of you were on for the first day for the hospital session. I just want to send a reminder that this is for, through the Delta Region Community Health Systems Development Program. And that, that particular pro program is funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy in partnership with the Delta Regional Authority. Marla Dum, again, will be your trainer today from BKD. And since most of you have been on um, for the last couple of days, I'll keep my introduction and script really short there. But I'm going to send it over to Cineva to just give some rem reminders of some housekeeping pieces before we turn over to Marla to get started. Thanks, Kate. So as Kate said, my name is Cineva Hackman. I am the program coordinator for Delta Region Community Health Systems Development Program with the National Rural Health Resource Center. I'd like to welcome you all today to part three of the BKD Billing Coding Bootcamp Rural Health Clinic Training. We're glad you could all take the time to be here with us again today. So before we get started, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping details. Uh, when you call in, your phone line will be muted to unmute or remute your line. Press star 2. Once you call in, please keep your computer, spe computer speakers on mute to avoid any echo or feedback. You can and communicate via the chat box at any time, which is located on the left-hand side of the screen. We will go over any questions at the end of the presentation. The file share box is located right below the chat box in the lower left corner. Um, contains a copy of today's webinar materials. When you click on the name of the file, you can then click on the download button to download that file directly to your computer. Throughout the presentation, there will be a polling question that will be asked. Um, the polling question will be in a gray dialog box with a question. Please answer each question to the best of your own knowledge. Today's webinar will be recorded, and a link of the recording will be provided to you when it is uploaded to the website. I'd now like to turn it over to our speaker, Marla Dumb with BKD. Great. Thank you, Senator. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, for those of you who were on the session yesterday, we appreciate you joining us again today. Uh, we have some different information to go through, um, but Cinevo, I thought it might be good to open it up for to see if there's any questions that we had from yesterday's session that I could answer quickly before we get started. All right. Yep. If not, that's fine, too. I thought we'd give you an opportunity to um, catch up from yesterday since that information was fresh. And star two to unmute your line. Okay. All right. If there's no questions, that's that's fine. Just wanted to give you all an opportunity before we got started. Um, we should have opportunity at the very end. There's not as much information for this last session today, um, so there will be um, time for questions at the end of the session, um, as well as um, the um, phone calls that we are scheduling with each of your facilities as well. Um, but Paula and I will be on those calls, um, so you can hold on those questions as well. Oh, uh, yes. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. This is Roland Dale at Harden Medical Center. Uh, this is a carry carryover for the last couple of days. Um, sure. I, I um, wanted to clarify. Mo uh, I'm I, I'm going to say I'm a senior coder. It doesn't mean I know everything, but. But the other thing that I, the other thing that I find though in in the presentation is we we do know the coding rules and, and and a lot of that and of course the billing information is helpful too. 
but I haven't heard a lot about clinical validation, and that's different than coding. We're finding yeah. a lot of our denials are coming not because the codes are wrong, but because the content of the medical record does not support the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the severity of illness and the intensity of service. And, yep. and yep. You're, you're, you're about the second or third round that we have, that I've had in this over the last two years. And but <laughs> no one seems to be addressing this clinical validation piece, which is separate from coding. I don't mm -hmm. know if, 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 um, if, if Delta will be addressing that, but it's a major concern for me, particularly as I interface with the physicians. And, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and then we're getting these, these denials, uh, particularly on sepsis, and you know what that is. But yeah. I just wanted to ask uh, be, before <laughs> before you go away. <laughs> yeah. No, Roland, that is a wonderful question. Yeah. Um, and really, for the Delta Group, yeah, this is a topic that may be of interest to uh, your your facilities. Uh, and, and you make a very good point, Roland. And, and sometimes we include some of that education in separate um, HCC coding, risk validation, clinical validation training. Um, because you're exactly right. Um, the industry is moving more into the quality of care. Obviously, everyone's very well aware of the value-based movement, um, the different payment methodologies that are directly related to the ICD-10 codes, um, and in great part um, tied to um, the clinical severity of the patient. So, that is becoming something that we are doing more and more education on. And although it was not included here, I am very happy to speak to that because you're exactly right. Um, there is great increased um, uh, focus on the clinical documentation, both on the facility side for inpatient coding and on the clinic side to include the rural health clinics. Um, and I know a lot of our um, facilities and RHCs that we work with um, are have been a little slow to integrate that, although on the hospital side, it has been a movement in clinical documentation improvement over the last, oh, I would say maybe five to ten years. It has really picked up um, importance on the hospital side only because there was more importance on that side for the DRGs, particularly for those of you on the PPS side. Um, that has slowly been trickling down to the professional side. Not that we weren't uh, busy educating physicians and non-physician practitioners in their documentation detail for the hospital side, um, but now the uh, push, at least for what I educate on uh, particularly, is with our providers on the clinic side to make sure that across the board their documentation is extremely clear. Uh, particularly on the detail of the patient's condition, their signs, symptoms, comorbidities, um, and especially when we are gathering that hierarchical condition category or those HCC diagnoses uh, that may be impacting that patient throughout that benefit year or that calendar year that we need to pull out of the record. And you're exactly right. It is, it is a big concern, um, and I know that we are really making a push this year to do a lot of CDI or clinical documentation improvement education that will be focused with our professional staff as well as coding billing staff um, just so that we can continue to assist um, our clients and um, others in the healthcare industry on this. On this. So yes, your point is very well taken. Um, when we do presentations on ICD-10, we do really dig into clinical documentation. Um, and it is more than just um, worrying about the medical necessity that the payers are looking for from an, a CPT perspective. Um, now there is the concern of the ICD-10 or our diagnosis codes that are going through because that is what is driving your payment on the managed care side. Um, if you have a Medicare managed care plan particularly, although um, it is becoming um, pretty consistent on the commercial managed care side. Um, as well, where they 
want either HCCs or risk adjusted diagnosis codes to show severity of condition uh, to um, offset what they're paying uh, the facility or the organization, how they uh, determine those um, payments for each year based on your population of, of risk, um, as well as quality measures that you may be reporting for HEDIS or any other payer of quality reporting methods. So uh, thank you very much for that question, Roland. And yes, it is a huge issue. Uh, and I greatly agree that the clinical documentation needs some significant improvement. Uh, we had hoped that with the advent of ICD-10 uh, and education just from the entire healthcare industry to our, our professional staff, uh, that there would be an improvement in documentation. And although we did see some, uh, we also saw some providers who retained their habits from ICD-9, which was just basically uh, nonspecific documentation. Um, and so it is a continued education item that we um, address usually in any professional staff education um, scenario, uh, especially when we're talking about their documentation. So we, I appreciate that comment and that question. It's, it's a huge thing. Uh, so yeah, um, um, Delta, uh, the, the national rural may, may want to consider that as a topic uh, for their facilities in, in, the, in the coming year because it is a huge, huge issue, yeah. And it's interesting that you mentioned that you're seeing a lot of denials for that. So that just speaks to the importance of it. Well, thank you very much. I just wasn't sure. Um, where, where we're going with the Delta program. I'm very mm -hmm. glad that we're part of it. Uh, it just, and, I, and I'm dealing with HCCs now. And so it makes, it's a real challenge. The documentation is a real challenge for me. And I just wanted to, to know if we're ever going to address that, that part of it. Um, but, yeah, but and if, if the organization, uh, yeah, absolutely. And thank you for bringing it up. I, I think the you know the the ladies who are on the call from the, from the resource center. Um, it is a it is a definite education topic that would be of interest to all of your facilities, including your clinics. Um, and I know that we uh, particularly um, can also educate on um, just the process of capturing HCC codes from the documentation. What documentation is eligible for that? Um, because there is documentation, particularly on the hospital side, that is not eligible for us to look at in order to pull that information from. For example, no nursing notes, no diagnostic testing reports. Um, there's just a very distinct list of not only documentation, but providers that we can pull um, information from in order to accurately code those HCCs. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great topic, and, uh, and uh, we appreciate you bringing up that that and uh, both Paul and I will are, we'll be educating on that throughout 2019 so if it's something of interest to the resource we'd be more than happy to help thank you for that question um, any other questions before we get started thank you you're very welcome very welcome all right let's go ahead and get started and as I said we should be done uh, in good time today, so there will be time at the end also for questions, and then we do look very much forward to speaking with you all uh, during the one-on-one -on -one calls that uh, the, the resource is setting up for us. Um, so to start with today, this is really just uh, taking some additional time to go through um, some of the high uh, points within the rural health clinic that we often see our clients struggle with. Um, and making sure that not only the documentation is there, but also the billing is correct for some of these services that cause issues in the RHC. Um, you know, yesterday we went through some of the rules under Medicare and state Medicaid on, you know, what is an encounter and who is a core provider and, and how to send through your UBO for more of the details in the benefit as to what you can and cannot do as far as billing. Um, today we're going to drill down on some additional specifics about some specialty care as well as some of these Medicare routine physicals that are causing some confusion, especially on the primary care side. So first we're going to talk about the routine annual physicals versus the Medicare wellness visits. And I'm going to separate out my language to differentiate those two because they are distinctly different. Um, so I will say routine physical 
and I will say Medicare wellness visit to separate those two. Um, and these have caused a lot of angst, not only in the coding community, quite frankly, um, but particularly on the professional side, because they get very um, upset about how am I supposed to document this, what am I doing, what am I picking for a code. Then you have coders who are not sure either based on the documentation. You've got uh, folks at the registration desk who have scheduled the patient for one thing, and when they get in the room, it's a completely different item or issue, and it, it just leads to a lot of confusion. And then once the bill is dropped, often then you'll have those very pleasant conversations with your patient when they call in to say, why am I being billed for this, or why did it, was this not covered? Um, so we want to walk through a few of these distinctions. Um, first, we're going to talk about the welcome to Medicare physical. That's what this was called to begin with. Um, the acronym of IPPE, which although it has physical examination in the title of it, that's very misleading because these do not have a physical examination to them other than vital signs, other than vital signs. So Medicare in some ways did a, a little bit of a disservice to their goal uh, to have their members receive this service because everyone thinks that this is just a replacement for the routine annual physical, and in fact, it is not. Um, the goal of the Welcome to Medicare physical was, first of all, to provide this as a benefit for those beneficiaries who are first entering the Medicare program. So these are for those uh, patients that you have who are just rolling into Medicare. Often um, our clinics, um, rural health clinic or otherwise, will um, kind of have that as a front desk um, task to note or someone's tracking their patients to see when they do roll over to the Medicare program so that they know to bring this up with their patients um, as an option to have done. Um, these are voluntary services. These are not mandatory, um, although highly recommended by Medicare. And the goals really for these wellness services uh, was really to provide a baseline of information for the medical staff as well as to provide a tracking tool for screening, as well as just observations of potential risks for the patient that may or may not be observed or documented or discussed in the course of a normal medical exam. Um, and this really was also to um, um, advocate um, preventive health is really what Medicare rolled these out for. Um, although, for whatever reason, Medicare still refuses to pay for a routine annual physical, at least they made this move forward so that there was a little bit more about um, the disease detection, obviously health promotion, that's why they rolled these out. Now, the Welcome to Medicare physical can be performed within that first year, any time within that first year. Um, and then basically that clock starts ticking once you have accomplished this Welcome to Medicare physical um, or wellness uh, visit. Um, it also does include an EKG if ordered by the provider. And we'll go through those different codes uh, that were set up under the Medicare program for those EKGs. You want to have a G0402 set up in your system. That is the face-to-face -face encounter code. Again, this is going to be for your patients in that first year of Medicare eligibility. And it is not a routine annual physical. This is a wellness visit. So you would not have that instead of um, the wellness code if, in fact, this is what your doctor or your non-physician practitioner do documented. And the work is very different. Uh, I have links at the end with the forms that outline all of the items that should be discussed during these wellness visits, and they are definitely not uh, similar to a routine physical, other than some history that's taken, the vital signs, but really more it's um, asking those additional questions, making some additional observations, um, putting together schedules for screening, lists of providers that are part of the care of these patients that may be in your RHC or outside of your RHC. 
um, to include uh, maybe they're going to specialists that are completely out of your system. Um, those are also included on that list. So there's some additional perks to uh, this program. If the provider does decide to order an EKG or perform an EKG as part of this wellness visit, uh, then you would want to have these additional codes set up in your system. The G0404, which will be billed um, to Part B by a freestanding RHC and by the parent hospital. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, no, that's correct. <laughs> sorry, I was getting myself confused. Would be billed by, uh, to Part B by a freestanding um, RHC or for a provider-based RHC would be billed by the parent hospital because that's the technical component. The G0405 would be your interpretation code if your RHC provider um, runs that EKG and then interprets it on that same day. Okay. Now, these services follow your normal detailed billing, so they do go out on the UBL4 under new code 521. Um, so you would submit that for this service. They do not have coinsurance or deductible. Again, these are covered preventive wellness services under the Medicare program. And again, this is just primary Medicare. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, a, a lot of the Medicare managed care plans do not recognize these, although I have heard that they do uh, recognize if you're filing any charges to secondary, um, if at all, if there's other services for that same day. So they don't necessarily kick out the code, that, but um, they may or may not pay directly on that or, or have any input on that at all. This is a primary care or primary Medicare benefit. Uh, the payment is made at the all-inclusive rate for this service, um, and it does meet one of the exceptions that we talked about yesterday where um, there are possibilities to receive more than one encounter rate per day. So, for example, if a patient was new to the Medicare program and was in the office for their um, visit for their diabetes, um, they could perform this work and build this additional G code on that same day. Um, they would have a coinsurance for that medical visit, um, but not for this G code on that same UBO4. Um, you would also apply either that 59 or 25 to the G code. And that would tell Medicare that we uh, have support for two encounter rates for this day, for the medical visit and for this Welcome to Medicare physical. Um, that is the only wellness service where they have that exception uh, to pay you twice in one day. So a little bit of a perk, a little bit of a, uh, an incentive. Um, now, for the purposes of this training, we did not go into great detail um, on some of these documentation requirements because the forms are available on the Medicare website. Um, but just as a, a brief overview, uh, these are not your usual and customary routine and annual physical um, topics. You know, they do want some history taken. They do want the vital signs taken. But you're also doing things like looking at depression risk, um, cognitive risk. You're putting together um, lists of the providers, as I was saying, that are part of that care team for the patient, um, as well as screening lists of potential screening uh, tests or services, training, education. Are those services available in your clinic or system, or do they need to go out? Uh, will you need to assist them with referrals for those services outside? Um, I'm also looking at, uh, once you get into the wellness visits, uh, the annual wellness visits, it even gets into more detail, and we'll go through some of that. Um, one of the services that used to be included in and still can be included in the performance of a Welcome to Medicare physical or wellness visit is the advanced care planning. And the American Medical Association several years ago decided that this was a significantly separate service that should be represented by a code um, and should be billable and payable. Um, and so they uh, moved uh, with the code 99497. They put that into place in 2016. Um, this is also a standalone or billable service in the RHC setting. So it can be uh, discussed with the patient and billed on a UV by itself. Um, sometimes that may be why the patient comes in. Perhaps they're facing a very serious um, um, disease. 
uh, and they want to have that opportunity to talk to their healthcare provider about end of life discussion. Uh, you know, do we need DNRs? Do we need to start talking about living wills and the plans that we need to make for when that time comes when uh, I am able to make those decisions for myself now about what interventions I want to have done um, versus later on down the road when I may not be able to make those decisions and then that puts a burden back on the family. That's what this advanced care planning is. It's just like talking to an attorney um, about those decisions. This is for your health care decisions where you're talking to either the physician or the non-physician practitioner. So it can be performed on the same day as any other service. Um, so in this example that we're talking about these wellness visits, it was always considered part of recommended discussion during these wellness visits to have that discussion. If you are, if your providers are including that in their discussion during that um, initial Medicare uh, wellness visit or during any of the annual wellness visits, then that's an additional code that you will list on your UBO form. If it is listed at the same time, then you're just paid one encounter rate for everything. Um, if it is done at the same time as a, a medical visit or any other service, paid under the same encounter rate. It will also be paid as a standalone service under the encounter rate if that's the only reason the patient came in. Um, this is to be performed by your core providers, uh, your physicians or your non-physician practitioners. Uh, we get a lot of questions about who can do the advanced care planning. Um, sometimes it's a combination and a team effort between medical professionals. Sometimes uh, we have had questions on whether social workers or psychologists uh, could also provide this. Um, that is something that Medicare has not said they're not um, eligible to perform. Um, they would be part of that care team, obviously, that might be discussing advanced care planning. Um, what you want to remember as a rural health clinic <clears throat> is that your nursing staff for your Medicare and Medicaid population, uh, because again, this advanced care planning code is eligible for any payer, any payer. We, we focus on the Medicare in this discussion, <clears throat> excuse me, but the code and the service is eligible and payable um, for any payer. Um, so you want to remember that for primary Medicare and, and primary state Medicaid, uh, these services would not be performed solely by the, by the nursing staff. Um, we have had several clinics uh, over the time that have gotten into trouble for um, just having patients round through the nursing staff to have paperwork filled out and questions asked um, and without any intervention by the physician or non-physician practitioner at all, and that's a big no-no on the RHC side. Again, that's a nurse service and cannot be billed to Medicare. Uh, so we did have one um, RHC that we worked with several years ago who just had a wellness visit day and would farm them through their uh, nursing staff, and they had to pay all of that back. Um, so just a word to the wise. Remember, you are a rural health clinic, and so for those primary federal payers, uh, you cannot have this service done by the nurse. And really, essentially, that's what most payers are looking at. They need to have intervention by the physician or the non-physician practitioner because although it is a lot of question and answer, there is some decision-making that comes into this. Um, you know, they're looking at the observations of the patient. They're looking at the answers that the patient has made. They're making decisions on how do we proceed. Is this going to be a significant medical problem now that we need to address in a, from a medical perspective, or do we need to pursue screening services? And that is medical decision-making, which cannot be done by your nursing staff. Um, so just a note on that. Some additional information about the coverage, which we spoke to just briefly, uh, but if the service, the uh, advanced care planning is furnished on the same day as another medical service, then you'll only get the one encounter rate. And in that scenario, because there is an eligible medical visit on the same day, in addition to this covered advanced care planning, the coinsurance and deductible will apply. If you do the advanced care planning as part of either a welcome to Medicare physical um, or wellness visit or any of the other annual wellness visits, you'll get one encounter rate, but the coinsurance and deductible will be waived because you're doing that in conjunction with a covered uh, wellness service. Okay, so you want to keep that in mind as well. So after the patient has had their um, initial uh, welcome to Medicare wellness visit, 
um, and or if the patient has been in Medicare for quite some time and needs to just begin their wellness visits, we move on to the annual wellness visits or the AWV. Um, and in most circumstances, this is the visit that I usually see in a primary care setting. I'm seeing more of these than I do the Welcome to Medicare um, wellness visit, which I'm not sure if it just kind of gets lost when the, when the patient moves over to Medicare. Uh, but in a lot of circumstances, this is really the focus that some of our clinics have on these services. Again, this is not an annual routine physical. And I know that uh, we heavily recommend education with your professional staff because they don't understand that either often. Uh, Medicare did a very poor job at rolling this out. Um, and they did make that confusion that this would be a covered annual physical once a year. Um, and so patients got that message as well. And so when they call and schedule and they say, I'm in for my routine visit, this is what they think they're getting. They're getting that free visit. Um, and so it's, it's, it's on the burden of us as providers to make sure that we educate our patients about the difference between these services as well as our internal staff, that everyone's on the same page, that these are different things, particularly from a scheduling perspective. Um, I know that I worked with several large multi-specialty clinics in the Wichita, Kansas area who did a huge marketing campaign when these first rolled out uh, because they were confused at first and knew Medicare had not done a good job at explaining these services for the patients or their internal staff. So they had internal education. They put out uh, marketing information to their patients about the difference and the, the uh, fact that there would be still some patient responsibility if they were in for a true routine physical. Um, they had posters up in their waiting rooms. They had posters up in their front registration area. Uh, for the first couple of weeks, I thought it was very amusing. They had buttons made up that everybody wore. Ask me about an AWV. And, you know, it was just really a great marketing campaign to enhance the education about these services for their clients or for their patients. So that is something to consider as well. But you do want to make sure that internally everyone's on the same page about what these services are. For the annual wellness visit, again, this is going to pick up after they've had their Welcome to Medicare um, wellness visit. And the clock does start ticking after they've had that visit. A year from that, it has to be a full year that's passed, then they're eligible for the next one in the series. And you would start out with the initial service code, which would be GO438. And again, this would be the first wellness visit that would be billed for a patient who has already been on Medicare uh, for years and is just starting that wellness journey. Uh, so you would start with the initial code first. And then from then on, they would be subsequent visits, the GO439. Okay. Now, for whatever reason, the EKG that can be, can be ordered, those G codes that we talked about um, are only applicable when the patient is in for the Medicare, um, welcome to Medicare wellness visit. So if your providers are doing the annual wellness visit or the subsequent annual wellness visit um, and they order an EKG, you would fall back to your usual 9-3 codes, your 93050 or the 930010 uh, uh, to perform those services. Otherwise, if it's part of that welcome to Medicare wellness, then you'd fall back to those specific G codes because Medicare is tracking these, of course, to see how many other beneficiaries are receiving these services. Um, the annual wellness visits, of course, there's the initial and then the subsequent, and those are annually. So you have to keep track, of course, when the patient has those services, and a year from then you can provide that service again. The coinsurance and deductibles are not um, applicable, and you do also report these on your UBO4 claim forms. Uh, the annual wellness visits can also be performed. Um, on a date with any other service. Um, let's say the patient is in for therapy. Uh, they can also receive this. That would be a separate medical service. Um, if they're in for a medical visit and they, um, it's time for their annual wellness visit, the, the provider can go ahead and complete the work for this as well. Um, and the billing would be similar to what we um, spoke to earlier. <coughs> oh, excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, eligible providers are really the same here as well. Uh, you're looking towards your core providers to provide these annual wellness visits. Sometimes it is a team of people. Um, as we said earlier, your RNs or your MAs or your LPNs in themselves cannot provide this by um, solely. 
Uh, they may be assisting the provider. Obviously, they're taking the vital signs, um, maybe taking that history of the patient, just like they would for a medical visit. Um, but they cannot complete the entirety of the work. They cannot complete all the documentation, and they cannot just have the doctor sign off on it. Um, for those categories where the physician needs their assistance to help fill things out, that'd be fine. Um, but that physician or non-physician practitioner needs to also observe, make notations, and also decide how that patient is going to be um, treated or ha what the next follow-up or next steps will be. Um, this is, gives you a little bit more detail about the documentation, and this flows back to what would be required for the medical or the Welcome to Medicare Wellness as well. You're basically building on to that baseline. Every time you see that patient annually, this tracking tool is just updated each time um, in the hopes that things are um, prevented. It's a proactive baseline uh, versus just treating things that the patient actively has already. Uh, this is a baseline to prevent or um, advocate um, a lack of risk for these patients. So again, you want the medical history, uh, a working list of those providers and suppliers that are regularly involved in your patient's care. That's within your organization and outside of the organization. It's really advocating that care team for the patient, whether they're inside your um, facility or out. Um, for example, if you are in a very rural area and you are their primary care providers, but they go elsewhere for cardiovascular care or um, endocrinology or other specialty care, those doctors are also included in that list. So the providers within your organization know who to reach out to if needed uh, for care in those particular areas. Um, obviously, uh, uh, vital signs are taken. Detection of cognitive impairment. This is when these observations or questions begin, uh, where you are making more uh, medical observations for the patient. Review of potential risk areas for depression. Also looking at just those um, activities of daily living. Um, are you able to drive your car? Um, are you having trouble with the stairs in your home? Can you make meals? Um, are you saying, uh, are you feeling like you're staying at home all the time? Are you able to get out? Um, is family coming to visit you? These are things that you're observing and asking the patient about. Um, obviously, a written screening schedule and list of risk factors and conditions for which our clinical professionals are advising interventions uh, that may be recommended or may be ongoing. Maybe they're already scheduled, um, et cetera, as well as referrals, if needed, um, to those services if outside your organization. Um, it, again, it is a uh, running working list. So once you've gone through your initial annual wellness, then your subsequent visits will just continue to build on to that. Uh, the providers are responsible for updating that documentation each time that patient is seen, uh, just so they have that um, ongoing tracking tool. There's also a health risk assessment, or referred to as an HRA, that is also to be part of the annual wellness visit documentation. Uh, this is a form that is really developed by your organization, specific to your patient mix. Um, Medicare said that they would not devise a standard form similar to what they did with the rest of the criteria for the Welcome to Medicare Wellness visit, and as well as the annual visits. Um, because they wanted this to be pertinent and applicable to your patient mix. So you want to take into consideration that it's a, an easy form that can be completed in 15 or 20 minutes. The form is really to get the patient's own uh, feedback on how they think they're doing versus the clinical staff's observations and determination of what they think is wrong with a patient based on observation, questions, and answers. This is how the patient feels. Um, or their uh, um, observations about their own health or other criteria. Uh, this would be completed prior to the visit, and that's for each year when they're seen. It can be completed by the patient before they get there, or if they need help filling that out, they can always come in and fill that out with the nurse or the provider. Um, it needs to be updated with each visit, and this form will also include all of their prescriptions or over-the-counter medications that they're taking. Um, and again, it should be uh, user-friendly for your patient mix. 
Uh, maybe you have a patient mix that has varied languages, so you would want to form in each of the languages. Um, well, you need an interpreter to help with that. Um, but it needs to be pa uh, patient friendly so that it can easily be completed by them. So it's a collection of self-reported information versus clinical observations. Um, and it's tailored to communicate the needs of your patient mix, as we said. Um, you want to address in the form demographic information. Uh, have, uh, you know, questions and answers, uh, ability to have the patient self-assess their health status, um, their frailty level, and their um, level of physical functioning, and also psychosocial risks. You know, are they feeling depressed? Are they happy with their current life? Are they being stressed? Um, and also looking at, is are there behavioral risks? Uh, that are either observed or you need to maybe get some additional information on. Uh, for example, is a patient lonely and it does not have much company or family, they're staying at home a lot and now they have increased their alcohol use. Um, is there something that may have been observed but you want your patient's uh, impact or uh, feedback on their behavioral risks? Um, obviously going towards that clinical decision making about what may need to be um, done to assist the patient. Activities of daily living as we address, just all those things that are occurring in our homes and how the patients are handling those items. Uh, you know, are they able to groom themselves? Again, can they drive their own car? Are they able to get around? Um, are they falling more frequently? Um, sometimes these things are not addressed during our regular visits with our providers. Uh, they may not ask the questions and the patients in most circumstances aren't going to tell the providers unless something has occurred um, like a fall with an injury that forces them to come in. A lot of our older patients particularly um, don't, don't share a lot of that information. Um, so those are questions that are part of that health risk assessment. So I've provided the links to the tools themselves, which provide in detail not only the criteria that must be filled out, but some guidance for those. Um, and there's several ways that, that you can document these in your medical record. You can use the tools themselves, uh, fill those in, and then scan them into your electronic system. Um, I have had some practices that have just literally kind of made an electronic copy of that tool so that it can be just easily incorporated in the, in the documentation for the data service. Um, I've had some really great uh, documentation templates uh, that some of my primary care providers have done where they have um, incorporated the annual wellness visit items into their routine annual physical template into separate sections so that, you know, if they're doing a routine annual physical, the head-to-toe comprehensive physical exam um, and all of that work, and then they all
also complete all the annual wellness visit work, that that's all in one nice form. Um, so that is also helpful. It's really up to your organizations how you want to incorporate that documentation and make it user-friendly um, for your providers. So those links are there as well. Um, I also provided the link to the CMS Interactive Preventive Services tool, which basically looks like this. Um, they went um, interactive several years ago, and I think it's a very nice tool. Um, they basically have identified all of the current covered preventive services under the Medicare program, and you just click on the box that you want to look into, um, and then the information will pop up, which will provide you with um, frequency in information, how often can that test be performed or covered. Um, for example, pap smears can only be covered every two years unless you have a patient who is um, high risk. For example, it has all the information for the annual wellness visits or the uh, Welcome to Medicare wellness visits. Um, gives you the CPT or HICS fix codes if there are any um, recommendations or requirements for ICD-10 coding, that will be listed. Um, just a lot of good information. And I have had some providers um, who have printed out information that they need for patients that uh, they see frequently for the same type of issue. Um, and they will have that information in their um, um, exam rooms. And I've had some really proactive groups that just go ahead and laminate all that and keep it in the exam room so that, for example, like colonoscopy screening and things like that that are very routine conversations, that when the patient says, well, is that covered? I don't know. They can easily reach for that laminated guide and be able to have that conversation with the patient so it becomes very user-friendly. So just remember that with preventive services, there's always frequency limitations. Uh, you want to pay attention to those. Um, if you have a service for a patient that does fall outside of that frequency limitation, um, for example, the patient may want um, a breast and pelvic exam every year, although they are only covered every two years, um, but just for their ease of mind, they do want to have those every year, then that one that falls on that opposite ear would be patient responsibility for that breast and pelvic portion of the well woman exam, um, and then you could get a waiver to make sure that they understand that would be their responsibility uh, versus someone who is a high-risk patient who can have those every year, for example. But this also follows to any uh, service that you might provide, particularly diagnostic in nature, that may bump up against a policy, a local coverage determination that either has a frequency limitation or perhaps a medical necessity limitation uh, where it is required for that provider's decision making, um, but the diagnosis of the patient does not meet the local coverage determination policy, uh, so you want to make sure to get a waiver in that circumstance as well. Um, this is just a, a brief copy of the ABN. We're all very familiar with that. Um, just make sure that your organization has in this current copy because Medicare does update those uh, every so often. I believe they dropped a new one just a year or so ago. So just make sure you are, uh, your clinics have um, access to the most current ABN. So we've talked about the wellness visits and the difference between the two. Um, now we're going to talk about the true routine annual physicals. Um, and we're going to discuss just some, some really some coding background on how you really want to code those services. Um, but also remember that Medicare, primary Medicare, does not cover or pay for a routine annual physical. Um, I wish they would change their minds on that, but it's been years and years and they still won't. Uh, there's only a portion of a routine annual physical that they will pay, and that is for our female patients for a breast and pelvic exam. Um, which we will touch on. Otherwise, the remainder of that work, when they do a head-to-toe physical and they're doing that comprehensive history and the decision-making that's part of a preventive visit, um, whether they need to order tests or they need to uh, order additional screening services, um, that is all non-covered and is assigned to patient responsibility. So they are two distinctly different things. That's why I usually refer to them as wellness, covered, physicals, not covered. Um, under the Medicare program. And that's the education that you need to have with your patients when they do register to make sure they understand, first of all, what they're wanting to schedule for, um, and then is there any impact on what they may have to pay. Um, the routine annual physical, of course, are usually covered once a year by most payers. Um, oops, I did skip a slide there. Um, 
the routine annual physical is also based, you know, you want to base your coding on the documentation of the work that was performed. Um, when I am speaking to professional staff, I usually remind them, you know, code your services. You know, we code all of our services after the fact. And, and the, for some reason, the routine annual physicals are coded based on what the patient is scheduled for in nine times out of ten. Um, and so you want to make sure that when you're educating your professional staff or you as coders on the, on the call, we code based on what the work uh, is documented in the medical record. Um, it's not what the patient was scheduled for. And I really caution any electronic medical record systems that are automatically pulling into the chief complaint what the patient scheduled